Hello and uh, very welcome, you are very, very welcome to the last of um, Fern's Fireside. Do you know, we've done seven weeks of reading seven of my previous books, she says, showing off. Um, and today is, uh, this week is um, the latest book, which is coming out in paperback, I think the end of April. Anyway, it's called Daughters of Cornwall, lovely cover. And it's based on my grandmother who, um, None of us knew until after she died uh, that she'd had a little boy when she was probably about 18, um, perhaps around the beginning of the First World War. Um, but he found us after she died. He found my mum, who was his brother, and um, my mum's his sister, you know what I'm saying. Um, and he did go on to have his own family and I am respecting his own family's um, wish to you know stay out of the limelight but uh yes so that's the story and it's a story of my grandmother who had her illegitimate little boy and had to give him up and then it's a story of my mum who was in the ATS in the war these are her medals um they they're just not just I mean these are her war medals um these are the small ones these are the ones to wear for luncheon not the big ones that you would um, otherwise wear. My sister has those because she's the oldest sister, of course, oldest daughter. And um, yeah, so it's 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 based around my family and truth, but of course I've fictionalised an awful lot of it as well. Oh, and by the way, today is April the 12th, the day we've been longing for. And uh, don't go mad, you know, enjoy it. None of us are gonna go blue and mad, are we? No. Just cool it, enjoy it. Um, except I'm lying to you, today's not April the 12th, because if on April the 12th today, I am filming, I'm away filming. So I'm filming this last week in the cold, which is why I've got double socks on and all that. Uh, and um, I'm dressed in my yoga kit, because I've got yoga after I've, uh, Zoom yoga, after I've read this. And uh, so you will see me in the same clothes every night this week. Is that understood? Of course, of course it is. Anyway, here we go. So, prologue. Caroline in Calizion, Cornwall, present day. It is said that the failings of a family bloodline repeat themselves through the generations until eventually someone, possibly centuries later, breaks the mold. Whether they break that mould with a newly acquired error of personality or by bringing in a fresh bloodline with its own chaotic genetic makeup, it's hard to tell. Whatever, I am certain that your family will be no different to mine. A long line of women who have toughened themselves on the anvil of life, all with broken marriages, broken hearts and long held secrets. The story I'm about to tell you is the one I've observed from my birth. Tales I have picked up, as any child does, sitting quietly and forgotten, eavesdropping as the adults reveal their shocking truths. They dropped their pebbles in the pond and the ripples spread outward through their lives and into my own, where they lap still. Everything I have, I have worked hard for. Everything. I bear no grudge. I'm not a materialistic woman. I'm a widow living within my means, watching my beautiful daughter take the leap from adolescence to adulthood, carving her own path. She will find a suitable boy, settle down, and be a wonderful wife and mother, as I was. Now, I know that's sounding like this could be my story, but it isn't. This is the girl called Caroline, okay? Um, and also, as my mother almost was, as her mother, Clara, certainly wasn't. Glamorous, strong, and passionate, she lived her life by one rule. To be a liar, you have to have a very good memory. And she should know. I didn't know any of this until very recently, and I must say it's rather disturbed my equilibrium. I like to think of myself as a woman who does not wear her emotions on her sleeve. Losing my mother was dreadful, of course, as was my husband's illness and death. I was proud of my outward stoicism, my resilience and the spotlight of grief. That was until I overheard one of the church ladies talking about me behind my back. I heard them in the choir stalls discussing my lack of emotion, my cold-bloodedness. And then 
something I would prefer not to think about, it being so crude and unpleasant. All I will say is that their unkind laughter followed me for days afterwards. I miss my husband dreadfully, his kindness, his affection, his success. He climbed the ladder of the corporate world and gave me the secure world I had craved. Darling Tom, he knew how hard my fatherless upbringing was and how hard I have striven to lead a normal life after the rackety one my mother brought me into. All that has paled into insignificance now, for I have discovered another family skeleton. My mother was not the only one to have her secrets, to get pregnant out of wedlock. Everything I thought I knew was a lie. It arrived on my doorstep just a few days ago, a huge steamer trunk made in the days when people travelled the world by ship rather than hopping onto an aircraft. The courier thrust his docket at me to sign. This has travelled a long way to find you, he said, as if personally affronted. All the way from Malaysia, via Singapore and Kent, by the look of things, and it's bloody heavy. Are you sure you have the right address? Well, you are Caroline Belay, though. Yes, well, uh, I was, that's my maiden name. Then yes, this is the right address. I went to the vicarage just up the road in Calazion first, but the woman there said the only Belay, though, she knew was you, and she gave me this address. He handed me a docket. Sign and print, please, and I hope you don't find a body in there. <laughs> he laughed until I gave him the look. The one my husband and daughter feared. I signed the piece of paper and opened the door wider for him to carry it into the hall for me. Sorry, love, my job is to deliver it to the door. That's as far as, far as I'm allowed to go. Cheers. Oh, hang on. He patted the top pocket of his shirt. Yeah, you'll need this. It's the key. He handed me a small brown envelope and left me with the mysterious cargo. By the time I had dragged the trunk into the lounge, I needed a cup of coffee to give me the energy to open the thing. To be honest, I was more than a little wary of the contents. What could they be? Why had it been sent to me? Who had sent it to me? I finished the last of the two digestive biscuits that I had allowed myself and rinsed my coffee cup, putting it on the drainer. Come on, Caroline, I told myself, the time has come. Back in the lounge, the trunk sat waiting. I circled it, reading the various labels. Most were aged and illegible, but there was a name printed along the front edge. I went back to the kitchen and got a duster and an aerosol can of furniture polish. The trunk was leather, and as I removed the grime, the natural hide began to shine. I made out the letters E H B and an address for a rubber plantation on the island of Penang, Malaysia. I recognised the initials Ernest Hugh Balitho, my grandfather, my mother's father. All I knew about him was that he had died in Penang back in the seventies, having never returned to his English family. I kept on polishing until the entire bag emerged, old but gleaming. I had been through so much of late that the idea of opening up the past was both comforting and terrifying. I had kept my family tucked out of sight for years and only Tom knew the circumstances of my birth. I often wonder if keeping my secret to myself actually pushed people away from me. Tom, you see, was my first boyfriend. I couldn't believe it when he spoke to me one Easter Sunday after church. His parents were high Anglicans and kept the sort of decent, normal home that I had longed for as a child. The trunk was almost clean now, but I kept on polishing and there was nothing more to do. The time had come to open it. Mm. We have a bit more. Just, just another couple of pages keep us going for tomorrow. Chapter one. Clara, Kent to Calazion, Cornwall, December 1918, one month after the First World War ended in armistice. Oh, I came up from Kent last night, just me. I knew as soon as I got the letter from Bertie's mother that I had to go. I packed my bag and willed myself to stay strong. I kissed them both, Philippa and Mikey, and told them I would be back soon. And then I left them shutting the front door behind me 
and walked away towards the station. I would not let them see my tears. My withered heart, now rigid against life's blows, would make sure of that. And yet there was still a voice in my lungs screaming at me to turn around, go back, give up this fool's mission. I faltered and almost turned, but the pull of seeing Bertie's home and meeting the family that might have been mine was stronger. In London, I found a boarding house close to Paddington Station, just for the one night, I told the unsmiling landlady. In reply, she pointed to the poster behind her. No noise after six, no gentleman callers, breakfast at eight and money up front. I handed over the payment she required and she showed me to my room. It was at the front of the house with a view of a terrace of white stuccoed houses, really quite pretty. I didn't sleep well and was up early, fearful that I would miss my 7.35am train to Cornwall. Quietly, I washed and dressed, creeping over the dingy rag rug which barely covered the splintered boards. Obligingly, they did not squeak. And downstairs, I let myself out into the dark morning. From the pavement, through the bow windows, I glimpsed a dining room, tables laid up for breakfast. I hadn't eaten since leaving Kent yesterday, but I wasn't hungry. I walked briskly to Paddington in the cold morning air, my breath coming in cloudy trails. Paddington Station loomed ahead, lit up in the dark, a welcome glow for morning travellers like me. Even with the sun not yet up, the station was busy. A steady stream of recently arrived commuters was heading towards the exits and the underground. Smart, young, working women, older men with bowler hats and velvet collared, velvet -collared coats, and young men in uniform, some on crutches, some with missing arms, and one with dark glasses and a white stick. I swallowed a hard lump that popped unexpectedly into my throat. My eyes darted over each of them. Could Bertie be among them? Maybe these men had seen him, fought with him, had news of him, had watched him as he wrote his long and loving letters to me. The blind soldier was greeted by an older woman who touched his arm and said his name. Mum? I had to turn away. The moment was private and I couldn't watch. Want to help with your bag, miss? A porter tapped my shoulder, making me jump. No, no, I'm fine, thank you. I held my bag close to my thigh and set off to find my platform. This would be the longest train journey I had ever taken. Bertie and I had talked about it many times the excitement of meeting his parents and brother and sister. We'll take a picnic on the beach. There are sand dunes and rock pools full of little crabs and shrimps. Do you like to swim? I haven't tried, I said. I'll teach you, he said, wrapping his arms around me. It'll be cold, but I shall keep you warm. I had never known anyone as kind. He kissed my hair. My parents will love you. I was nervous now. I had found my platform and my train was waiting. Good. I shall say goodbye. I'll see you in a minute, but see you tomorrow. Hello. It's still cold outside here on April the, what are we today? It's actually the 7th, but hello, April 13th. Did you enjoy your freedom yesterday? Did you get your hair done? I wish I could get mine done. <laughs> so anyway, I'm filming some stuff uh, this week, which is why I'm recording these. And um, yeah, when they finally come out, these shows, you will see. That I saw this white. How can that be? I'm 22, for heaven's sake. Around the ankles. <laughs> right, okay, here we go. Um, we had met Caroline yesterday, talking about her boyfriend, Bertie, who's been away fighting in the war, First World War. And... Um, Sorry, not Caroline, Clara. Caroline is Clara's granddaughter. Also. So this is when Clara's very young. Uh, First World War. And um, she thinks her lover Bertie has been killed perhaps in the war. But his parents in Cornwall have written to her. So she's on a train from London down to see them in Cornwall. I was nervous now. I'd found my platform and my train was waiting. I almost turned round to go home, back to Kent, and the two people I loved so dearly. 
A swirl of anxiety, panic, was building in my chest. Would I be found wanting by Bertie's family, or would they accept me immediately as one of them? They might like me, but would I like them? The train carriages had long corridors along, corridors along one side and a set of small seated compartments down the other, each compartment housing six seats. Excuse me, I stopped by a railway employee holding a whistle and a flag. Could you point me to carriage C, compartment two, please? The man kept his eyes on the passengers surging around this platform. Yeah, next one down. Thank you. I found it easily. A piece of white paper with C marked on it was stuck to the open door of the carriage. Stepping on board, I turned left and found my compartment. It was empty. Thank goodness. I was not in the frame of mind for idle chatter with strangers. I settled myself on the seat next to the window, forward facing, with my travelling bag on the seat beside me, hoping that by spreading myself out like this, I might deter fellow passengers. I removed my gloves and coat and folded them on top of the bag next to me. I was building a rather nice defence. Once settled, I looked out of the window watching the farewells. Kisses for the women, handshakes for the men. I'll write to you and let you know how it's all going. I'll miss you. See you soon. I love you. I wondered what their stories were. So many people with smiles on their faces, hiding God knows what in their minds. Pushing through them, I saw an older man, on his own, quite short, with a tiny bristling moustache. He had a folded newspaper under his arm and was making heavy weather of lugging a suitcase down the concourse. I took an instant dislike to him. He had that look of arrogance and entitlement that so many men carried. He was obviously looking for his carriage and through the window he caught my eye. I shrank back in my seat. He lifted his fist and banged with his knuckles on the glass. Is this carriage C? he bellowed. I looked down at my shoes as if I hadn't heard. He knocked louder. Is this carriage C? he shouted again, as if I were deaf. I was forced to reply, yes. Why didn't you say so? He shook his head and tutted and then bent to pick up his heavy case. In seconds, he was bumping in through the sliding door of my compartment. Ah! He seemed to inhale and exhale all the air in the carriage simultaneously. I do like an uncrowded carriage. He thumped his case on the floor. I saw immediately that his mission was to spread himself even wider than I had. He coughed and huffed, moving his case almost up against my own small bag, effectively hemming me in. And I looked firmly out of the window as all of this was going on at at least he couldn't sit next to me, and surely he wouldn't sit in the seat directly opposite me. Without turning my head, I slid my eyes around to check that what he was doing. He was dusting his bowler hat with his coat sleeve, and I suspected it was done to attract my attention, to trick me into some sort of conversation. I stayed silent. His hat went on the rack above the seats, his coat went next, removed and carefully folded, and finally, brushing some invisible lint from his jacket, he sat down, exactly opposite me, just as I had hoped he would not, his knees mere inches from my own. Ah, oh, he made himself comfortable and opened his paper. That's better. Beautiful day for travelling, isn't it? I did not reply. I did not wish to encourage any dialogue. I turned my eyes back to the window. What did he mean it was a beautiful day for travelling? There was the station roof above us, so you couldn't tell if the sun was up yet, and on the platform there was still people's breath on the chill air. I shall open the window for us, he said. Can't stand being cooped up. He put his paper down and stood again. I moved my knees to one side. He pulled at the leather window strap and lowered the glass, letting it go with a thunk. He sat down. That's much better. The smell of burning coal and soot and shouts of porters loading baggage, not to mention an icy blast of December air, flooded the carriage. I wondered if I should put my coat back on, but that would only promote more unwelcome comments. I could feel him looking at me, inspecting me over his half-moon glasses. You look as if you could do with some fresh air, he said, if you don't mind me saying. I'm perfectly fine, thank you. Going all the way, are you? Sorry? Penzance? No. 
I looked down at my lap. My velvet bag, which had held my ticket, purse, handkerchief, lipstick and cigarettes, were in it. And how I wished it had held a book or magazine too. I am, he continued, going all the way to see my son. He's just come back from France. Alive, thank God. Lost a couple of fingers. A miracle, really. Hand grenade exploded on him. He made corporal, like his grandfather in Crimea. Very proud of him. Do you know Penzance? I shook my head and again looked out of the window, praying that he would stop. My prayer went unanswered. Terrible thing, this war. The war to end all wars is what they're telling us. He lifted his newspaper and waggled it at me. So many young men gone. Heroes, the lot of them. Apart from the conchies, of course. He sniffed loudly. <laughs> Cowards. He shook his head and tutted. <sighs> they're all right, Jack. They never had to face the enemy, did they? No. And what's happened? We've lost a generation. All those brave lads, the brightest and the best, all gone. My fingers tightened around my bag, rubbing the weft of the velvet. I'd heard all of this before, people spouting off about stuff of which they had no experience. Patting my hand, telling me how proud of Bertie I must be. I wanted to scream at all of them, shout at them. Of course I'm proud of him, you fools! I felt the unbidden anger raging in me again and I gripped my hands into two bony fists, hoping to gain control over the violence within me. The man kept going. <laughs> we won, though, and that's the important thing. Please don't, I said loudly, surprising myself with a vehemence in my voice. He stopped smiling and looked at me in astonishment. What, he said? Don't talk about the war. I was only making conversation, he said, being civil. I told my wife I blame the suffragettes. Young women have forgotten how to make pleasant conversation. All that driving ambulances and thinking they can do a man's job. He stopped abruptly, a thought dawning on him. He nodded slowly. Oh, I see. You've suffered a loss, haven't you? Someone close. I can always tell. A lot of women have suffered. Many sweethearts left behind. I don't suppose you'll ever marry now, not with all them young men gone, forever. I feel sorry for you. He lit the fuse inside me and my bomb exploded. How dare you, how dare you presume to talk to me in this way? You know nothing about me. All right, all right, get your hair on, dear. Grief, <laughs> what is it, love? Turned many a woman difficult, you know, grief. Shut up, just shut up and leave this carriage and close the damn window as you leave. My voice was rising in pitch and volume. Crikey, he said, gathering his things. Looks like some poor bloke is better off dead than married to a fishwife like you. You'll never get a bloke like that. He stood up to retrieve his hat and coat. I shall find a more amiable travel companion if that's the way you are. Outside on the platform, the last door was slammed shut. A guard's whistle blew and the train suddenly lurched forward. The man fell back almost into my lap. I pushed him off me and he fell forward onto an edge of his huge suitcase, dropping his paper as the wind was knocked from him. He scrabbled to his feet, rubbing his shoulder. I picked up his newspaper and threw at him. I pity the poor woman who married you. Shaking his head but keeping his lips firmly closed, he left the compartment. Left in the peace of my carriage, I closed the window and then searched for my little bag for my handkerchief, angrily wiping away hot tears as, with another jolt, the mighty train wheels, powered by coal and steam, began to pull away from the platform. I cried tears of grief and anger on and off for a further hour or so, appalled that I should do this in a public space, but glad that it deterred the few passengers still walking the train's corridor from joining me. And now, several long hours later, I was finally crossing Brunel's great iron bridge, the Royal Albert, taking me over the river to Tamar, from Devon into Cornwall. Mm. There you go. Now, this is going to be when she arrives in, uh, in Cornwall. It's the next chapter. So, see you tomorrow. See you in a minute. Hello. So now we are on the train to Cornwall with Clara. It's 1918. She's a young lady from Kent um, whose love 
has probably been killed in the First World War. Well, she hopes it's not true, but she's she's had the news. Uh, it's not missing, lost in action. It is saying killed in action. So her name is Clara, and she's on her way to Calla Zion, which is uh, Bertie's home in Cornwall. Bertie being her love. December 1918. I leant my head on the cold glass of the train window, drinking in the outside scenery. Bertie had described all this to me time and time again. He'd insisted on reciting all the romantic names of the Cornish station stops. Now, as soon as you're over the bridge, you come to Saltash, the gateway to Cornwall. Why is it called Saltash? I'd asked. No idea. Then, after Saltash, it's St Germans, Menheniet, Liscard. I interrupted him. I'll never remember all those names. Just tell me when I need to get off. I'm getting to that, Miss Impatience. He inhaled comically and continued. Saltash, St Germans, Menheniet, Liscard, and then Bodmin. I shall be waiting for you at Bodmin. Will you really? We have been lying in the tiny bed of our Ealing home in West London. I'm not sure I'd have had anyone wait for me anywhere before, I said. What sort of blighter would I be if I didn't pick up my beloved fiancé after she's travelled all that way to see me? Hmm, you'd be a very bad blighter indeed, I smiled. He held me closer, dropping a kiss onto my head. I can't wait for you to meet my family. Father will adore you. Mother too. Although she may not show it at first. She's always a bit cautious about new people. But Amy and you will be great friends. She's always wanted a sister. Brother Ernest can be a pompous ass, but he's not a bad egg. It'll be wonderful to feel part of a family again. Well, you are the bravest person I've ever met. He squeezed me tightly, his arms encircling me. My stoic little squirrel. At this point, I'm sorry to say, I had already told a few lies to Bertie about my upbringing. Needs must sometimes. My parents were wonderful, I had fibbed. And I miss them every day, but I feel they'd be happy, very happy for me now. Shameless, I know. Do you think they'd approve of me? He asked. Oh, Bertie, I said they'd adore you. The train guard was walking the corridors as he did before arriving at every station. Bobman Road. Next stop, Bobman Road. I steadied myself to disembark. Standing on the platform, I watched as the train chuffed away down the line and out of sight on its journey towards Penzance. The sun had set and the Cornish winter air blew gently on my skin. I took a scented lungful. Mm. Bertie had told me that it was warm enough down here to grow palm trees. You're pulling my leg, I'd laughed. No, I'm telling you the truth. We have one in our garden. I'll show it to you. I picked up my bag and walked past the signal box painted smartly in black and white towards the ticket office where a sign painted with the word taxis pointed. Even now, even now she half expectedly hoped that Bertie would be waiting for her and it made her breathless with longing. I've read that in the wrong way round. I've read that. She's speaking in her first person, so I'm sorry, I'm going to do that again. Even now, the half-expected hope that Bertie would be waiting for me made me breathless with longing. I imagined him running towards me, his long legs carrying him effortlessly, his strong arms collecting me up easily, lifting me from the ground so that my face was above his, the look of love shining between us. Excuse me, miss? A man with a peaked hat walked towards him. Would you be Miss Carter? Yes. I thought so. You looked a bit lost on your own. He had a kind face, but not too many teeth. Welcome to Cornwall, he held out his hand and I shook it. We had a, he had a good handshake, dry and strong. I'm your taxi to Calzion. Name's Chewton. At your service. Let me take your case, miss. Oh, yes. Reverend Belitho wrote to me to explain. It's very kind of you both. No trouble. I'll put your case in the back and you sit up next to me. You'll be warmer. Tewton was a fountain of all local knowledge. He gave me a running commentary with potted histories of the family houses as we passed and pointed out a couple of shops he thought I might be interested in. There's the post office, a very nice ladies' wear shop. Won't be as good as your London shops, mind, but you're bound to find something pretty to suit you. Mrs Chilton told me to tell you that. I felt a panic of alarm. 
Do many people know I'm coming? Oh, yes, you're the talk of the parish. Mr Herbert was loved by all of us. We missed him when he was doing his rubber planting in Malaya. What a thing, eh? Tutan shook his head incredulously. Malaya, poor dear. He had a pet monkey, you know. I felt the familiarity of tears pricking the back of my eyes. Yes, bingo. That's right. Mr Herbert told me all about the tricks that monkey played, running off with Mr Herbert's breakfast, hiding things around the house. The tears tightened in my throat. I wish I'd met him. Ah, Tutan smiled. You may not have met the monkey, but you did meet the man. Yes, I swallowed hard. He was a wonderful man, wasn't he? Brave man, Tutan replied. One of the best. We said nothing more to each other, sitting with our own memories. And we were out of Bodmin now, and the headlights struggled in the shadowed lanes. Great tunnels of trees blocked out any starlight. I could make out small cottages, some with their lamps still lit. And as the car came to a sharp bend in the road, a white owl took off from a signpost and flapped away, calling as it went. At last, we passed a road sign telling us that Calazan was just one mile away. Winding our way down a steep lane, then bursting out of the darkness of another tree tunnel, we turned left at a tiny crossroads with a small village green. Upon the muddy, mole-hilled grass, a sign advertised Christmas Jumble Sale, Church Hall, 2pm, Sunday. Tutan pointed it out to me. We'm raising money for our village war memorial. Mr Bertie will be on it. Three houses down, he stopped the car. We were outside a large iron gate. Here we are, miss, he said as he pulled on the handbrake. The vicarage, let me get the door for you. He carefully helped me out of the car and then lifted my case from the back seat. I searched in my velvet bag for my purse. How much do I owe you? Nothing at all, miss. The amount has been settled by Miss Amy. I held out a shilling as a tip. Please, for your trouble. He waved it away. Well, for the war memorial, at least. He looked at the coin doubtfully before winning the battle in his mind. Thank you, miss. Very kind. That'll be for Mr Bertie. He touched the peak of his cap. Have a nice day with the vicar. He's a lovely man. He looked at the coin doubtfully before winning the battle in his mind. Thank you, miss. Very kind. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Reading my own words and I get lost. I thought, oh, I've just written that. Oh, no, here we go. Tutan drove off wearing a cheery hand and left me standing outside the cold iron of the house's gate. Bertie's home lay beyond. I looked up at it. A big house, big house, the sort I would have drawn as a little girl. A front door in the middle and on either side four bay windows, two up, two down. I sat in the middle of a square garden. Oh, sorry, the house. It was sat in the middle of a square garden with a hedge that seemed to go all the way around it and a path leading from the gate to the front door. There were several neighbouring houses. All had wisps of smoke coming from their chimneys, indicating the warmth inside. From the vicarage chimney, there was nothing. Bertie had warned me to pack twice the usual amount of warm underwear, as his parents did not like heating the house unless completely necessary. Maybe when there's ice on the inside of the windows, he told me, but not before. I hadn't told him that I knew all about freezing homes in bitterly long winters. I didn't speak of my cruel beginnings to anyone. My past life was a closed book, my secret. Instead, I had told him that my parents had been farmers in Kent, hard working but comfortably off, and that I was an only child. Well, that bit was true. The next bit was not. I told him of a tragedy that had struck when a fire in one of our oast houses had taken hold and both my parents, one of the pickers, had died trying to put it out. Fortunately, there was enough money from the sale of the farm, I told him, for me to go to a boarding school for young ladies where I had been taught extremely well by very kind women who, with care and love, had helped me to forge a new life. All a lie. Standing outside Bertie's home now, I was glad he would never discover the truth. What lay in front of me was a fresh chapter in my new life, a chapter without Bertie.
You can see where this is going, perhaps, or perhaps you can't. So, that was Wednesday. It's Wednesday today, isn't it? Yes, Wednesday. It'll be Thursday tomorrow. Yes. See you in a minute. Hello again. Welcome to Thursday. <laughs> Thank you for playing with me. Um, I'm loving reading this book, you know. I only wrote it a couple of years ago, but um, I was on tour with calendar girls at the time so it was quite fun to try and fit writing in around I think we were doing eight shows a week which is quite a lot of time late nights early mornings I'm not very good at that I like early nights and late mornings <laughs> the other way around anyway here we go so we know that Clara has arrived now in Cornwall she's standing outside her um, unfortunately dead boyfriend's house which is the vicarage in Calazan and uh, she's about to knock on the door. We also hear she's been making up a lot of her past life to make her sound like a better person. Here we go. It was getting cold and I was shivering. I wrapped my coat tighter around me, collected up my case and opened the tall iron gate. Taking a deep breath for courage, I walked the chequered tiled path to the front door. The navy blue paint was chipped, particularly around the letterbox. I imagine the letters of condolence that had been dropped through it since the black-edged telegram had been delivered. The terrible news. It is with the deepest regret. Killed in action. Blah, blah. God save the king. I hesitated before pulling the bell. Bertie would want me to be brave. No point mooning about, old girl, I could hear him saying. The bell rang deep in the house. Inside, I imagined the two servants Bertie had talked about, Dora, the maid of all work, and Cook. They would have heard the bell and been expecting me. Dora would be drying her hands on her apron, pushing the escaped strands of hair under her cap and scurrying from the kitchen into the chilly hall and to the front door. I thought how Cook would have told her off more than once that day. Stop your jittering and jumping, she'll be here soon enough. Finish the ironing, that'll keep your silly brain quiet. And now here I was, the stranger they'd been waiting for, Mr Herbert's intended, Clara Carter, a thin, pale woman in her very early twenties, with hazel eyes that could be lively if they weren't sad. How would Dora describe me later, downstairs behind the closed door of the kitchen? Oh, the poor lamb is broken with grief. I could have hugged her there and then. And Cook would clasp her hands over her bosoms in sympathy. Oh, the poor duck, what was she wearing? Black, of course. I think she had rouge on her cheeks, so cheers to cheer herself up. And red lipstick, too. Oh, dear, Cook would say. Mrs. Belitha won't like that. Not Miss ne I Amy, neither. What about her hair? Brown and crimped into a bun. And she's so thin, there's no meat on her. And Cook might shake her head sadly. Well, she won't be getting fat in this house. Another mouth to feed on the housekeeping that Miss Amy gives me. Well, it doesn't go far enough as it is. What did you say to her? Well, I says to her, hello, miss, as polite as I could. Welcome to the vicarage. Please come in. And she says, thank you, in a nice voice. And she looked around the hall while I put her case by the hat and coat stand. And then I says, Miss Amy will be along presently. And, and she'd lead me into the parlour. Did you take her coat? Cook would ask. Oh no, I asked her, but she wouldn't. Shivering with cold she was. Through pursed lips, Cook would say, Miss Amy needs to get that fire alight and quick. Mr Herbert would be horrified to know his sweetheart is upstairs getting frostbite. Dora would shake her head. I asked Miss Amy if she wanted a dit lit after lunch to warm the room up, but she said... Mm. And then perhaps Dora would suck her cheeks in and make herself a little taller to speak in a posh, dismissive voice. Whatever for? Cook would sniff. Oh, if she doesn't get a move on, Miss Amy's going to be a shriveled up old maid. What a way to greet your brother's fiancé. And where's Mrs. Belay, though? Lying down. It's the stress of it all. Well, that's what Miss Amy said. If you ask me, Miss Amy is the one who's giving Mrs. B stress. Pass me the eggs, Cook would demand. I shall bake a welcome cake, a big one. It's the least I can do for the poor girl. And now, as I stood on the front step, Dora came to open the door and all that I imagined became reality. She took my bag, led me to the parlour and left me alone. 
I couldn't stop shivering. The parlour's bleak fireplace was swept clean. No ashes, no kindling, no box of logs at its side. I wondered if I should take off my coat and gloves. Would it be impolite to keep them on? My gloves were covered in smuts from the train, so I removed them and stuffed them into my pocket. Were there smuts on my face too? A mirror was above the mantelpiece, speckled and so high you'd have to be over six foot before you could inspect yourself. Bertie was so tall, he'd have been able to see himself in it. I took out my rather tear-dampened handkerchief and rubbed at my face. If Bertie were here, he would do it for me, bending down to make sure I looked presentable. He used to make a joke out of his height. He was at least a foot taller than me. When we lay side by side, he would wrap his warmth around me and call me his little squirrel. I mustn't cry. I mustn't cry. Be strong. I spoke into the empty room. I put my hanky back in my bag and felt for the cigarette case lying within. Silver and slim. Bertie had given it to me the first time he'd come home, before he'd had to go back to France. We'd been walking on Ealing Common. He'd taken my hand and led me to a small bench where we sat down. I have something for you. He'd reached inside his army tunic, pressed the little package into my hand and watched as I opened it. Bertie. I remember turning it over in my hands, tracing the ornate engraving on the precious metal. It's beautiful, I laughed. But now I'm going to have to take up smoking properly. Well, that's the idea. Every time you put a cigarette to your mouth, he said, rubbing his thumb over my lips. Think of me. He bent his head and kissed me. I think of you all the time, I said, trying not to sound too drippy but failing. I will dream of you when I sleep. And now, here I was, standing in his house, in a room he knew so well, and my knees went weak, and I recognised the impending wall of grief that would floor me at any moment. I pulled a cigarette from the case and tapped it on the lid, tamping down the loose tobacco strands as he'd taught me. Get a grip, old girl. I lit it and inhaled deeply, my lipstick staining the unfiltered end. <sighs> a sense of calm filled my veins. I closed my eyes and tried to imagine Bertie standing next to me, ready to introduce me to his parents. His pride in me, my pride in him. His mother would be happy and welcoming. Oh, you must be cold. I'll get Dora to light the fire and get Cook to send up afternoon tea. I squeezed my eyelids tight, pushing back the inevitable tears. But my silly brain conjured up an image of Bertie as a small boy, crawling under the chenille cloth of the tea table, winding himself in the heavy bottle green velvet curtains, jumping from one stiff sofa to its twin, unable to dent the horsehair cushions. I could smell him. Macassar hair oil and tobacco smoke. For a fraction of the moment, I, I thought I heard him say my, ma my name. I opened my eyes in fright and hope. It came again. Clara? He was here. There had been a mistake. He was alive. I reached a hand up to the mantle, a marble mantle and gripped it hard, willing myself not to faint. He called again. Clara? He was just on the other side of the door. I could hear his heels on the tiled floor of the hall. The door opened and my heart leapt into my throat. Tall, smiling, Bertie was standing before me. I let go of the mantle and opened my arms, waiting for him to embrace me. He offered his hand to shake. Clara, he said, at last we meet, Ernest Belitho, Bertie's brother. He caught my arm as my knees buckled. Oh my goodness, the journey has exhausted you. Uh, I'm so sorry, may I sit down? I felt for the nearest chair. Not that one, he said sharply, that's father's. And... He looked at the cigarette, burning its way towards my fingers. I'm sorry, but Mother does not approve of ladies smoking. He took the cigarette from me and crossed the room to open the large sash window that looked out, as I was discovered the next day in daylight, over the back garden. I could see the bell tower of the church lit up beyond. Outside, I knew, lay the palm tree Bertie had told me about, and in the middle of the lawn, an apple tree with a swing, I love that swing, he told me. Best toy father ever made for us. 
When I take you home, you shall sit on it under the apple blossom and I shall push you so that your toes reach the sky. Bertie was always getting caught up with his smoking. Ernest's voice broke through my memory as he threw the cigarette stub out of the window and turned back to me. I'll leave the window open. Mother has the nose of a bloodhound. How was your journey? You look tired. You're shivering. I'm fine, honestly. My eyes were fixed on the bare, dark branches of the apple tree outside. Bertie would never push me on the swing under the blossom after all. To my embarrassment and Ernest's discomfort, I burst into tears. Oh, dear, Ernest said awkwardly. Has anyone offered the facilities? He asked, looking around the room. Uh, anywhere but at me. Uh, maybe you'd like to um, freshen up? Yes, I would. I managed to thank you. Our maid isn't too bright, I'm afraid. God knows where Amy got her from. He coughed. <laughs> Needs must, I suppose. He pulled the bell rope by the fire and within seconds Dora entered. Yes, sir? He gestured towards me whilst issuing orders. Uh, please show Miss Carter to the facilities and ask Cook to arrange some tea. Mm. Oh, there we go. Oh, we've got over time. The maid bobbed. Yes, sir. I gathered myself and gratefully crossed the room to join her. And I was suddenly aware that I was badly in need of the lavatory and also to cool my face and neck. Oh, and Dora, Ernest barked as we left, put Miss Carter's luggage in her room. Which one has my sister got ready? Dora, her eyes darting from mine to Ernest's, replied quietly. Mr. Herbert's room, sir. Mm. Uh, one, two, three, we've done four, so tomorrow's Friday, is it? I hope so. Anyway, see you Friday. <laughs> In a minute. Ah, <sighs> here we are all again. <laughs> Seems like a moment since I was sitting here. Oh, welcome to the last day of Fern's Fireside readings. Um, I've really enjoyed it. And thank you for uh, putting up with me. That's all really. So this is the last bit of the book I'm going to read. This is The Daughters of Cornwall. And um, you may remember uh, Clara has arrived at her dead fiance's house in Cornwall. He's called Bertie. And he has a brother that she's just met called Ernest, who's identical, really, to Bertie, a bit younger. And uh, she's discovered that the, the maid and um, the sister to Bertie and Ernest have decided that poor Clara is going to sleep in Bertie's bedroom. So I'll pick that up. I thought I might faint again. What? Ernest hitched up the knees of his perfectly pressed Oxfords and sat on one of the ugly sofas, oblivious to my distress. Good, good, come back when you're settled. I followed Dora into the hallway and watched as she collected my small case from the foot of the hat stand and began to climb the stairs. I'll show you to your room, she said. Uh, oh, sorry, I don't know I should do this in Cornish. I'll show you to your room, she said. It's a nice room, overlooks the church. I took in my surroundings rather than speak. Linoleum, cold and bare in patches, covered the landing floor. Dora stopped at the second room on the left. Here you are. She opened the door with her free hand and stood aside to allow me to enter. A single bed with a brown headboard faced the one window. A washstand stood in the corner and a heavy mahogany wardrobe against the wall opposite. Dora put the case on the bed. Laratrice out of the door, turn left. It's at the end of the corridor. Miss Amy's room is just across the landing. Shakily, I thanked Dora and waited until she closed the door behind her. Here I was in Bertie's room. He told me about it. This bed was where he had slept. Those books haphazardly lying in the bookcase were the ones he had read. He had sat at that small table, labouring over homework, biting the end of his pencil and staring at the church at the end of the garden for inspiration. I opened one of the wardrobe's double doors and was hit by the powerful smell of mothballs. On the rail were three bare hangers, presumably for my use. I opened the other door and stepped back quickly. Hanging there was Bertie's coat, the one he had worn when I'd first met him. I reached out and touched its sleeve. 
then pulled it to my nose. Yes, this was him. This was his scent. Bertie, I whispered into the scratchy wool. It's me. I'm here in your room. I'm here. There was a knock at the door and I dropped the sleeve, shutting the doors quickly. Come in, I called. A woman, very tall and bony, entered. She wore a navy blue dress almost to the floor, high-necked and belted, and stood in the doorway without expression. Her sharp eyes took me in from head to toe. Clara, Mother and I thought this room would be the most suitable for you. Oh, yes, it is. Lovely. Thank you. You must be Amy. Bertie talked a lot about you. Yes, her eyes alighted on my case on the bed. But you haven't unpacked yet. Well, I only just got here and I'd like to freshen up before I come down, if that's all right. Yes, tea will be served in the parlour. Father will be home at 4.30. She moved as if to leave, then as an afterthought turned back. I don't like to keep meals waiting. Scary, sister-in-law. Chapter 3. Clara Calazan, December 1918. I brushed my hair, put on my smarter cardigan and touched up my lipstick. The church bell was striking the hour as I went downstairs and entered the parlour. It wasn't looking much more cheerful than when I'd left, but at least there was a fire, albeit struggling, in the grate. What it lacked in heat, it attempted in cheer. Ernest was on one sofa, as I had last seen him, and Amy was sitting opposite him, with an elderly woman on the other side. Here she is, Ernest stood up and smiled. Mother, this is Clara. Come closer, my dear. Her smile was clouded with grief. My eyes aren't what they were, and I want to look at you. Mrs Belitho, I went to her. Thank you so much for inviting me. Her grey eyes darted over my simple clothes and figure. Hmm. You have a good, ordinary face, she said to me. I like that. Bertie liked it too, I know. But too much lipstick. I stood my ground. Bertie liked it. Her mother folded her arms and chuckled. His mother folded her arms and chuckled, sorry. Ha! Bertie always liked spirited people, that's good. He also told us that you have family in Kent. Yes. And what do they do? They farmed apples and hops mostly, but we had an excellent dairy herd too. My lies poured easily into the room. How many acres? Oh, goodness knows. Around 200 at least. Ernest interjected. Jolly good. Yes. I gave him my practised sad smile. But nothing can substitute for the loss of one's parents when one is so long, young. Goodness, we didn't know, Ernest said apologetically. How dreadful for you. Mrs Belitho seemed to me to perk up at this information. Oh, my dear, come and sit down next to me here. She flapped her hand at Amy. Move up, dear, let Clara sit between us. I squeezed my hips down into the oversprung seat, feeling the thigh bones of the women either side of me. Amy tried to pull hers as far from me as possible, while her mother wriggled herself around to see me better. What on earth happened? How did your parents die? I hadn't yet thought through a cogent explanation, so I dipped my head and fumbled in my card and pocket for a handkerchief. Mother, rebuked Ernest, Clara will tell us if and when she wants to. Mrs Belitho covered her disappointment with a sniff. Well, I, I'm surprised Bertie didn't tell us when he had the chance. A sigh and a short pause before asking, You did tell Bertie, didn't you? Yes, of course, I told him everything. Well, I'm glad to hear it. And how is London? I believe you work there? Yes, as a secretary on the London Evening News. How interesting. We don't get that paper here, of course. My father, my husband prefers the Times. Before I could respond, Amy spoke across me. Mama, it's time for your cough medicine. I'm perfectly fine, thank you. Mrs Belitho focused on me again. I want to hear all about how you met our dear Bertie. And Ernest, dear, liven up that fire, would you? I watched as Ernest got on his knees by the hearth and reached for a log. Every movement reminded me of Bertie and the first time I saw him. Well... 
Bertie and I met at, at a bridge club in Piccadilly. Mrs Belitho nodded. Hmm. And do you play good bridge? Not as well as Bertie. I remembered him sitting opposite me at the small table, his slender fingers holding his cards. We won a couple of tournaments together. Ooh, you must be pretty good then, Mrs Belitho turned to Ernest, who was concentrating on the fire. Clara plays bridge. Perhaps one evening we should play. Rather, said Ernest. Amy, want to make up a four? I'd rather not. She shuddered with the thought of it. Where is Dora with the tea? She checked her watch. Oh, she's late. I'll go and chivy her along. She left the room in a rustle of skirts and left the three of us looking at the fire and trying to think of something to say. You must think think me very rude, I remembered. I, I haven't thanked you for the taxi you sent me to the station. A Amy organised that. Mrs Blytho waved a hand in the direction of where Amy had disappeared. She runs the house for me. The last few weeks have, well, weakened my spirits. She coughed lightly. <laughs> was Chewton waiting for you? Yes, he was. Ernest laughed. I bet a penny to a pound that he gave you a tour of the flesh pots of callous iron. Mrs. Bilitho tutted. No need for that language. Your father wouldn't like it. She picked up the small watch pinned to her bust. He should be home any minute. I told him to be here at 4.30 on the dot. As she finished her sentence, as if on cue, we heard the sound of a key in the front door and a deep, manly voice calling, Hello, I'm home. Has Miss Carter arrived? We are in the parlour, Ernest called back. The door opened to reveal an enormous man, both of height and girth. Bertie had once described his father as comfortingly solid. And now, seeing him, I couldn't think of any better words. He was dressed in a black frock coat, black shirt, black trousers and black gaiters. The only colour was the snowy white of his dog collar. Aha! He looked at me warmly. My goodness, how wonderful that you're at actually here at last. He took two strides to cross the room and took my hand and patted it. You are so welcome here. Even though Bertie didn't have a chance to tell us about you, we want to know everything for ourselves. You are certainly as pretty as we imagined. He turned to his wife. Do you not think so, my dear? Without waiting for an answer, he looked about the room. And where is the tea? It took just a few minutes before Cook's Victoria sponge and tiny meat paste sandwiches arrived, pleasing everyone and giving us all something fresh and safe to talk about. After tea, the Reverend Belitho withdrew to his study and Mrs Belitho returned to her bedroom for a rest. Amy bustled about with Dora giving instructions for supper and returning the parlour to its pre-tea state. Ernest and I were left alone. There we go. Now that we should keep you going. Uh, yes, Daughters of Cornwall. This was the, the hardback that came out last year. And I'm very happy to say the paperback is coming out this year. Uh, April the 29th, I believe. So a couple of weeks. Um, but otherwise, I want to just say thank you very much indeed for being here. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've certainly enjoyed reading them, although... It's stuttery, I know, but sorry about that. Uh, anyway, I will see you when I see you, and I hope that's soon. God bless. Bye-bye.